We're going to be in Revelation chapter 3 this morning, going to be wrapping up our discussion of Sardis and pushing into Philadelphia and then Laodicea. Um, so if we don't finish chapter 3 today, that's okay. That's why we have Wednesday, but here next two, three classes, we will be done with the seven churches. And then we're going to be leaving the comfortable territory in Revelation and going to the part that confuses all of us, which is all the visions and everything else. So, all that means is we might be picking up the pace, not because I'm going to be rushing through Revelation, it's just the visions need to be seen in bigger chunks, and we won't be doing as a nitty-gritty study because there's, as we said back on the reading apocalyptic literature class, not every image has a meaning. You're supposed to look at the whole of the picture, right? So, anyway, um, that being said, Revelation 3 this morning, uh, Zach, would you lead us in an opening word of prayer? Dear Lord, we thank you for this morning that you've created for us, for allowing us to wake and filling our lungs with air. Thank you for your creation and the beauty that we're able to see. We thank you that everyone was here, was able to gather here safely. We pray that you be with our minds that we are able to focus and that you would keep Satan and his temptation away. Thank you for the study that Brendan has done and help it to be of value to all of us. It's through Jesus we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Zach. And again, just going to remind people, just the three rules we have for class discussion, be concise, be scriptural, and um, hang on, be thoughtful. There we go. <laughs> Um, and also just remember the, what the proverb writer said, where words abound, transgression is soon to follow. Um, if you can make your comments in two to three sentences and really think through it, that's good. Um, I'm not saying don't ask questions, I'm not saying do any of that, but we want to get through as much material as possible, so let's be thoughtful with those comments, okay? Okay, so back in chapter three here. So we're just going to read the letter again real quickly. And we'll, by way of review, we'll talk about some things we talked about uh, Wednesday evening, and we'll talk about the applications we can learn here from Sardis. So, Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 1 from the Legacy Standard Version of your Bible, it reads as follows. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, This is what he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says. I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard, and keep it, and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come to you. But you have a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy." He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will never erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, so we talked about uh, Wednesday night, um, uh, how Jesus is described here in verse 1. What, what did we talk about on what... Uh, is being conveyed here by how Jesus is being described, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven angels, or the seven stars. Uh, I think that's Paul. Uh, basically, that Jesus is in control of who's in the church and who's not, and they're in danger of being not. Okay, so we talked about how these are two imagery, images that have come up earlier in the state of Revelation chapter 1. The seven spirits of God is the fullness of the spirit. Jesus is the one who uh, fully possesses the spirit, has all the spirit of wisdom. He controls the messages of the churches. He walks among the seven lampstands. And Sardis, you know, as Paul said, Jesus controls who is and is not in his body, right? So, very naturally then, what is Sardis's issue? That's their big problem. Somebody who hasn't commented yet this morning. Um, ignore the second question. Nancy? It sounds like they've become complacent. Mm. 
Okay. Maybe complacent. It just says uh, their issue in verse 1 is they, are, they have a name that, is, that says they're alive, but they're dead. What do we think that means, Morgan? They're no longer in it. They, okay. are, they have been excluded until they fix their ways. So they may no longer be in Christ. They may be excluded from the body. I think that's a very real possibility. Um, Paul? It says in verse 2, it says, I have found none of your works perfect before God. That they have not grown. They have not perfected their works, right? That there's nothing that they've completed. So Paul brings up that um, we, we see here in uh, verse 2, um, I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Um, so what's interesting is when we think back on some of the other churches, even the ones that were tolerating false teaching, some of them were, of, of God could say, your deeds now are greater than they were at first. Your love is greater now than it was at first. They still had some issues. Here at Sardis, there's no statement made like that. It's the church that starts many things but hasn't completed much. And we might even theorize, too, that Sardis perhaps had found a way to not rock the boat with the Jews or with the pagans. And they had basically sold out in order to not cause issues for themselves. And as a result of that, They've lost all effectiveness in witnessing. They've lost their saltiness. They've lost their light. They're an ineffectual church. They're basically a social club. And so, um, and that's included in everything that was said this morning. I appreciate the comments. So what is Sardis supposed to do about their condition? Andy? Well, I was talking about what you said earlier when you, when you, when you said that it's different to the church. Well, well actually, it's, it's still the same issue as the church because in verse 4, it says, Yet there are some in Sardis who had not so well their clothes with evil, so, so, so there were some exceptions even in Sardis. So that wasn't absolutely true. Most of them are not absolutely. Well, there is that exception, but they're a minority of the larger congregation, and yeah. Jesus still describes them as a church that is dead right. and not right. alive. Right. Okay? I appreciate, appreciate the comment, though. So, Okay. What was Sardis supposed to do about the condition? Repent. Repent, okay. What does that involve? It's one of those words we throw around a lot. Change of heart results in a change of action, right? Okay. So how are they to repent? Because Jesus named some specific things. Ron, you had something? Whatever remains of the proper way to live their life, strengthen it and work on it and improve mm-hmm. it. So Ron points out that the very first thing they're supposed to do, well, second thing, after they awake, because the implication of that statement there in verse 2, wake up, is that their current state means they're deluded. They're deceived. They're, they're, they think they're active, but actually they're, they're the opposite. They're anything but active in doing work for the Lord. So waking up means coming to the realization they're in trouble. Okay? It's enlightenment. Strengthen that which remains, as our brother Ron pointed out. They started a whole bunch. They hadn't finished anything, but that does mean some of the things they started are good works. So whatever good is remaining in the congregation, their first and foremost focus needs to be whatever is good, you need to focus on that. So a couple illustrations. You know, sometimes, you know, I've preached at congregations where the auditorium is this big and there's, 12 of us. In fact, it was bigger. I've been in groups where there was three of us Sunday morning and I was the visiting preacher, okay? Sometimes groups like that, all that remains, they, you're not, no one's expecting them to have the finances, the resources, do a grand evangelistic campaign, right? Or to be able to hire a located preacher or yada, 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 yada. For them, strengthening that which remains is just remaining faithful, right? Continue to persist in the timeless gospel of of worship and doing what they can when they can, right? Um, So we don't know entirely the the situation of Sardis, but whatever they have, there are still some good things and they need to focus on those things. What else does Jesus say they need to do? Chuck? The same as we're doing today, you've got to hold fast to what you've been taught. 
And most of all, if you're stray, you got to repent of it. Right. So we see, to Chuck's comment, we see in verse three, he said, "We got to hold fast that which we've heard, uh, we've received." And so Jesus says in verse three, "So remember what you have received and heard, and keep it, and repent." Go back to the beginning, right, Paco? And I like verse four because it talks about the few names that are not defiled. Here are some examples of who you can follow. You know, you're dead. Here are people who are not dead. You know, do as they do. You know, they can't have the excuse of, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. That's, that's not going to fly. Right. So Sardis has examples in the congregation, a minority, but is on the right track. Now, how my brain works, I can picture this congregation probably maligning that minority up until the letter's read. Of these are the hardliners, they're being nitpicky. Then, 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 then. And then Jesus gives this letter and says, no, these guys are on the right path. The rest of you need to follow what they're doing. Um, because oftentimes, in times of moral decline and, and, and compromise, those who hold the path, hold true to the, to the word, oftentimes are depicted or are, are maligned as being too stringent, too radical, and so forth. Um, and I like your comment, Paco, because they're Sardis is without excuse. They have people in the congregation that are doing what they ought to be doing, whose deeds are complete in the sight of their, uh, of their God, right? Nancy, then Paul. What you just said, I, I was thinking, as was mentioned before the end of verse 2, I have not found your works complete. So you need to start completing those works. You have good intentions, follow through, finish, do, carry it out to completion. And I think that don't grow weary in doing good, you know, and those kind of things come into play. It's like, keep going. Mm -hmm. And that reminds me of several parables, but one particular parable by our Lord about counting the cost, right? Which one of you who wants to build a tower will not first down and calculate if he has the resources and everything to complete the tower, unless he start the project and never finishes and he is a laughing stock, right? That's my retelling of the parable, but, um, you know, you, they started this walk, they started on the path towards their eternal home, and they need to see it through. Paul? So these, these are two takeaways for today. Uh, they're not part of what the initial audience necessarily would have taken from this, but um, there's some implications from this text, right? First of all, just because there's Christians in a group doesn't mean that the group itself is okay with Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Sardis is like, Jesus says, there's still a few of you who are walking the right path, but as a whole, you are very close to not being my church anymore. And the other thing is that he doesn't tell those people to leave. Mm -hmm. Um, just because the, the church that you're a part of has problems, um, you may even be practicing things that are not correct. It doesn't mean you need to go church shopping. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's parts of this country that, unless you've grown up in that culture, I, I find it, well, Caleb, you come from a part of this country where, you know, you can't, you can't spit one direction without hitting four church buildings. I mean, it, it's, and you can go church shopping. Well, a preacher wore an ugly tie this Sunday. I'm going to go, I'm going to go the one two miles down the road or whatever. I grew up in a part of the country where you were lucky if there was one faithful congregation in the whole metropolitan area. So you just, you had to stick it out and you had to make it work and you had to find a way to study through and work with your brethren and, and do all this stuff. Uh, and Paul's takeaway points are really good on the applications for today, ignoring that question. Um, is, you know, we have a tendency when things get a little bit difficult, we want to quit. And that's the exact time where we need to double down and, and be committed to the local work, right? Um, having lived through con a congregation that's been in conflict a few times, by the way, not here, um, it's not pleasant. 
there's an anxiety that falls underneath the congregation on Sunday morning because you don't know if brother so-and-so is going to cause an issue again or, or stand, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I will tell you, having been in a congregation where we work through those issues, we came out stronger than the other side with more affection and brotherly love for one another, and we became stronger because of it. And we were better equipped to handle these conflicts or disruptions later, right? Uh, it creates a very tight-knit group. But if you give up and throw in the towel, the moment something becomes difficult, you never get that. Um, I don't know how long these churches existed after Revelation was given to them. I don't. But I can theorize that if all of them made it through this, this trial in their life, that all seven of these churches, if they did what Jesus said, were going to come out on the other side of this period much stronger and healthier and tighter and more of a family than they did going into the trial. So, any other thoughts or applications on Sardis? Bertha? I just have something to pass up to Paul. Because I believe, as Scripture says about the eldership, mm -hmm. the leaders of the flock being spiritual men. Mm -hmm. And I have a problem if a church doesn't have spiritual men as leaders. Mm -hmm. Because how can they lead me? How can they watch over my soul? Mm -hmm. As the scripture says, if they're not, you know, fitting the qualifications. Right. So I will go look somewhere else mm -hmm. to find where I can worship in spirit and truth. Mm -hmm. Because there's more than just one thing that God calls us to do when we come to worship. Right. And so I just, you know, it's just not like a, a, a plain slate to say, Oh, well, they having all these issues, mm -hmm. uh, you know, hanging out. Well, back then, it probably was totally different, like you say, mm -hmm. because he's talking about this particular church. I mean, there, was, there were seven of them that he mentioned in right. that area, but each one of them had, well, there was one I think that didn't, right. had some issues, you know. So if you can, you know, if the leadership is doing what they're supposed to do, I don't think any Christian that's, Seeking to follow God would have any issues. Right. Eldership that's not doing what is called, you know, Scripture says to do, then the church is not going to stand. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and to that point, it's a good point of if we have biblically appointed elders, there's a lot of comfort and protection in that. Um, and I would say a point to complement that point is we also, it's interesting that seven churches, uh, we don't know if they had shepherds or not. Odds are they did. But if you notice, the, the, collect, the responsibility to correct the issues fell on everyone. Everyone doing their part, right? And, you know, sometimes congregations don't have elders. And I've been in places where I was younger and didn't feel like I had the right back then, but I would probably say to them now, it's like, I would look around because there's two or three men here that are qualified and should be serving. And can you really say you're doing everything you need to be doing for the Lord? If you know you meet the character traits of that office and you said, well, I don't, I, you know, there's any number of excuses. And don't get me wrong. I will never twist a man's arm to serve if he does not deserve or if he doesn't feel qualified. But in my experience coming from a part of the country where I've seen congregations go 50 years without shepherds, I think some men are cowarding behind the miswording of the, of, of the King James where it says, if a man so aspires the office. Uh, because this is a Brendan point, and you can disagree all day long. It's not scripture. I don't want to be on the day of judgment and stand before God and said, well, I didn't really, 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 really want it. You were the difference between elders and no elders, being fully scripturally organized and not scripturally organized, having shepherds and not shepherds. Brendan is not comfortable with that. And I must say that, emphasize that, that's me not comfortable with that. Um, that's the same thing with me preaching. Um, I could have done any number of things and made more money. <laughs> but... There was opportunity and ability and circumstances were pointing that direction, and I, I'm not comfortable. I would not be comfortable not doing this. And so when it comes to working with these congregations and so forth, yes, if they have biblically appointed elders, we need to take comfort in that. 
but also I think we need to be willing to work with congregations and save congregations that are working towards that direction, right? Um, if we see that progress being made. So, Terry? Well, that made me think of this. Do you think part of their issue with their deeds not complete was that they didn't have an elder or like a leadership? Because they weren't complete as what God wanted them to be? I think that's very likely within their own possibilities. Um, because, again, that's, we see pretty early on in the book of Acts that when Paul goes back through Galatia, <clears throat> it's really for the main purpose to appoint elders. Uh, Titus is left in Crete to appoint elders in every church. Uh, that was one of Timothy's works. And so a congregation cannot say they are fully scripturally organized unless they have biblically appointed leadership. That's God's design and purpose for, for it. So having deeds that are not complete... I would say it doesn't exclude not having elders, but I think it would, that's in the realm of possibility there. So, um, Andy, we need to move on. There's one application that I've heard about, about the section is, is if somebody actually lived in town, they only, they only, had, only had, had one congregation, and congregation was more, was, was more, more, was more, was more institutional, Church Christ, then the person can still be faithful there, but they have to, to, to not follow through with, they, with, with the things they do that are, 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 are not scriptural and scriptural in those cases. So that can happen too, where within a town where the only congregation have, 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 happens, to, happens to misuse the, the, the church's funds, but they still do everything properly as far as to learn stuff from the, those things. So, so, so that person can still be faithful. There. If I understand the question correctly, is it a proper application of this text where we could perhaps associate with congregations that we are, know that are not practicing? everything correctly or misusing or not holding to false doctrine but their worship is correct and maybe they're teaching salvation correctly I'm not going to give a cookie cutter answer on that every individual Christian must make that discernment call um, and my criterion for that is can I serve God in a clear conscience here that's a pretty big important question fellowship breaks down uh, fundamentally comes down to if you're concerned about your relationship with God, fellowship will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll die on that hill. Um, am I, secondly, I would, I would go in, you know, if, say the answer is yes on the first one. Can I, can I work and function and worship God in a clear conscience here? Okay, good. Can I be part of a, can I be part of a, can I help affect positive change in this congregation, right? Um, you know, that might be another question. Right, um, but other than those two principles, you know, I, I'm not comfortable going any further. Um, and we're dealing with what if questions, um, but we have to, you know, you have to. It's an individual decision or discernment principle that has to be has to be made in these situations, and you have to go based on what you know. Um, the scriptures do teach, um, and so by no means. If it's the only congregation that we think is sound or is remotely close, does that mean we need to overlook issues, right? Um, but, you know, um, I gave the illustration of Guillermo Wednesday night. Some congregations don't know they're practicing error. It comes from ignorance. And so perhaps you can be uh, the example, help bring about good change in that congregation or so forth. Um, but it, there's no hard and fast rule to it. Um, anyway, elders want to chime in on any of that? <laughs> okay, so uh, there's a lot we could talk about. Um, we do want to push into Philadelphia um, as we. So, Philadelphia is one of the two congregations of the seven that have no nothing explicitly wrong with them. In fact, I think we'll find Philadelphia to be um, the healthiest, if you want to use that term, of the seven. So, pick up in verse seven. We'll read through verse thirteen, and it reads. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, This is what he who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says. I know your deeds. Behold, I have given before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have little power, and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I am giving up those of the synagogue of Satan, those who say they are Jews but are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, 
and I will make them know that I have loved you, because you have kept the word of my perseverance. I also will keep you from the hour of testing, which is about to come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. <coughs> Excuse me. I am coming quickly. Hold fast uh, what you have, so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the sanctuary of my God, and he will never go out from it, uh, out from it any more. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the New Jerusalem, which comes down out of the heaven, out of heaven from my God, and my new name. He who is an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So Philadelphia, not a city in Pennsylvania. Just gonna say that right now, <laughs> Rebecca. This is probably really big to an earlier question, mm -hmm. where it says, "I will keep you from the day of testing." Mm -hmm. Does not mean that um, that church won't be part of judgment, mm -hmm. does it? No. So the the keeping from testing here uh, to Rebecca's question. Um, I think would more have to do with the fact that perhaps the persecution for them will not be as severe for others. Or it also can mean that the fact that they have nothing to worry about of what earthly consequences may suffer during persecution. Um, they will still have to stand at judgment, as we all will. Um, uh, and so that's coming for everybody. But for them, there is the promise... Uh, on the whole here in the letter, the promise seems to be that of vindication um, of the, the trials they are already suffering. So, uh, so Philadelphia, uh, it's one of those few words that we have transliterated from the Greek. Uh, that word in Greek means brotherly love, which is the saying of the official motto of the city of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. Anyway, um, literally means love of brotherhood. And Peter uses this word in, for example, 1 Peter 3 and verse 8, where he says, let the love of the brotherhood continue. Um, and so, but it's interesting where this is situated. I'm going to backtrack a few slides. Um, where this is situated in Asia Minor, um, I know you, we don't have the roads and everything here, but Philadelphia was known to, it was planted as a Greek, of, Greek missionary city, basically. It was a missionary city of Hellenism or Greek culture. And the, where that city is located puts it within reachable distance of hundreds of thousands of individuals in the ancient world. And so that's why the Macedonians and others use the city as kind of like a staging area to import Greek culture to their newly conquered lands. So there is an interesting bit of wordplay um, that Jesus is doing here in the letter because it's known as a missionary city for Greek culture, but Jesus is gonna give this a small church the ability to make it a missionary city for the faith of Christ. He's using that same geographical importance, but he's using it now for his purposes and his kingdom. So, uh, Bright, you had something. I have a question about uh, verse 11 when it says, I am coming quickly. I want to understand uh, what that means. Okay, so jumping ahead a little bit, Brad's question in verse 11 is, uh, it says, I am coming quickly. He wants to know what is the implications or what is the importance of that. So, the quickly language in Revelation, Revelation 1 and verse 3, I believe verse 10, uh, in the book, lo, I come quickly here, uh, this gets repeated a lot, and this gets repeated a lot in apocalyptic literature. The emphasis is that the people of God who are currently suffering are not going to have to wait their whole lifetimes to receive deliverance or salvation or comfort from their God. It's coming with very quickly within their times. There's no actual timetable associated with that, I come quickly, other than in relative immediate proximity to where they're currently living. Uh, so for the saints here at Philadelphia, we see in short order that God's going to vindicate them in the presence of those who are persecuting them, which seems to be the Jews of the city. Uh, now, if you look at secular history, which again, 
We use secular history not to establish the truth of the Bible, but to corroborate what the Bible has already said to be true. Um, persecution of Christians waxed a little bit, waned, excuse me, a little bit after, um, I just had his name. Anyway, after the Roman emperor currently reigning during this time dies. Think back to our, our history class on this. The whole reason Christians are facing persecution is because you have a weak, overcompensating emperor who feels the need to prop up his own power by doubling down on the imperial cult. Asia Minor is a hotbed of the imperial cult. cult. And if you refuse, you're basically labeled atheistic, seditious, and, and treasonous. Um, and so it wasn't just Christians, although by and part largely Christians who were receiving the persecution, it was Romans and others who didn't want to go along with this whole Domitian. That's the name. Okay. Go along with Domitian's little plan here. Okay. So if you look at secular history, Domitian dies a year or two after Revelation is delivered. And as often what happens when an emperor dies, the next one has to clean up the previous one's mess. And at least what we know, the next emperor, because Domitian, to memory serves correctly, did not have an heir. The next emperor was an old guy they appointed for the sole purpose to be a placeholder. And his job was just to keep the peace and keep everybody happy. So persecution kind of backs off a little bit after Domitian dies. It ramps up again later, and it doesn't get outlawed until 300. But I say all this, probably longer than I should have, but that the I come quickly, if we just want to line up things from history, it's probably a year or two away. Um, it's going to get real nasty before then, um, but relief is coming. And so that was probably a long answer to a short question, but that's kind of my two cents on that. It's, it's meant to give comfort, and did that answer the question? Or, okay. Um, Andy? Yes. If someone's reading today, how does it apply to, to, to today if they're reading and saying, I'm coming to, if someone's reading today, is it supposed to apply to, to everybody else? How does that apply today then? Okay, so the question is, how does that phrase apply today? Uh, first, for a Bible study method, it tells us that the fulfillment of Revelation happened in the first century. It's intended fulfillment. It's original fulfillment, okay? That immediately precludes any of the wackadoo interpretations that want to say revelation is going to be for you know a millennial reign or something else okay uh, secondly um, it does provide provide comfort for us today when we go through trials not that god's going to come and deliver us within two years or something but if god has delivered his people back then he delivers his people today okay um, we serve the same exact god that Abraham served, that Isaac, that Jacob, that Moses, he delivers his people. Now, how he chooses to do that, that's his prerogative, right? <laughs> um, and there's a lot of comfort in knowing that we have the full picture now, and we know where we're going, right? So, anyway, uh, Morgan and Rebecca. I did want to point out that even though I, th I, think, I think today, compared to the first century, Christians have gained a a lot of relief, especially here in this specific country, where we can go, uh, we can come every Sunday, we can go every Wednesday, we can get together, we can do things together, and not have to be concerned about being persecuted yeah. the same way. Yeah, we, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, because it's one of Brendan's favorite soapbox to stand on real quick, and I'm just going to stand on it. Um, one of my pet peeves is when I hear Christians complain about how bad it's getting for Christians in this country. It's not. And I will fight tooth and nail on that because this congregation in particular, due to Hugh's missionary work in China, we know what brethren in China are going through. We know what Christians in Northern Africa are going through. I get mission reports uh, through a brother who's preaching um, in um, Eastern Africa. I forgot the particular country where he's preaching in. But... We, we hypothetically talk about the care of orphans in this country. This preacher actually has to deal with the fact that, oh, I have three new orphans to take care of because their parents were just killed last week by Islamic terrorists. 
That's persecution. What China's going, what our brother in China are going through, where there's spies in the congregation, that's persecution. Oh, the White House doesn't have the national prayer breakfast anymore. Cry me a river. There are brethren who are dying for the name of Christ, and we're getting upset because, you know, people don't think the way we think in this country anymore. Don't get me wrong. You know, I, I would like everyone to believe the truth of the Bible. You know, that's, that's my whole goal, right? And that's all of our goals. But when we think about what our brethren elsewhere in the world are undergoing, for us to cry and complain because somebody's supporting immoral practices in this country, or they don't like what we believe, uh, I think Paul would probably have some pretty harsh words for us if he were alive today preaching. Um, the Brennan's soapbox is over. Okay, so, Rebecca. Um, from the beginning of Revelation, we talked about uh, the nature of Popcorn. This kind of thing. Yes. That's okay. Um, and so, as I read through it, I can't help but read through it on two levels. Mm -hmm. So while I understand the historical immediacy of I come quickly, mm -hmm. I also always remember the overarching message of you never know mm -hmm. when the end times are, mm -hmm. because I will come quickly when I'm coming. I mean, it's gonna happen. Yeah. And I just feel it all the way through Revelation, and in my mind, I would think that Jesus would never stop reminding his people that, remember, this is all going toward that. Rebecca, I appreciate your comment so much. Rebecca was making the comment that she can't help, and I would say don't try and help, but keep reading it this way, reading Revelation on two planes, two levels. We're supposed to. That's what apocalyptic literature is supposed to be read as. Um, we, we are given the earthly events, but then we're shown the heavenly realities behind those earthly events. And why there's original fulfillment in this, as Rebecca was pointing out, that Jesus would never tire of telling his people that I am coming quickly. I will come like a thief in the night, that we are to be prepared at all times. And so in that sense, these, these passages and to have that language are still applicable because Jesus could come in the middle of the Lord's Supper this morning, or he could come when I'm 98, or he could come three centuries from now. We don't know. Um, and so we always need to be ready. And we see a big issue with many of these churches is they became complacent, they became lackadaisical, they compromise, and they weren't ready. And part of the love of God is that he sends these letters to these churches so that they can become ready once again. So back to here at Philadelphia, and I appreciate these side discussions we have. I think they're important. Maybe my soapboxes aren't, but your discussions are. Um, we see here that Jesus is described as he who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David. Now, what's interesting is this is not an explicit callback to the vision of chapter 1. The holy and true, these are terms that are applied to God the Father throughout the Bible, and here we see it being applied to Jesus. Again, that should remind us that, yes, the Godhead exists in three distinct persons, but they're not as separate as perhaps we all like to talk about them. Uh, that that which is ascribed to God the Father is ascribed to Jesus, is ascribed to the Holy Spirit. There's still three distinct persons, but again, whatever it is to be God, all three of them have it, and they all exist in perfect harmony and unity in the oneness of God, um, of Yahweh. So, um, now, the interesting thing with the key of David here, and just very briefly, we got like five minutes left. Um, so, Let's just go with gut reactions here. What do you think a key symbolizes? Well, what a key can stand for. Think of perhaps modern day applications uh, or how we use keys today or something. Uh, Dennis? 
Okay, ownership, right? If you don't have my keys to my 2005 Camry, you don't own it. You can't use it. Uh, Paul? Well, I mean, when he describes himself, right, how does he describe himself? Someone who's got the keys. And he says, I mean, uh, opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. So back to Dennis's comment and Paul's is ownership, authority. If I have these keys, they're in my backpack, but if I have the keys of my Camry, I alone have the authority to open it and close it and to drive it, all that stuff. Now, I don't have the keys to Jim's Subaru. Jim has the authority to open and close it and all that stuff. Now, keys tend to represent authority or access, right? Um, and this is actually a call back to Revelation, not Revelation, Isaiah 22 and verse 22. Uh, and let's just read that real quickly. Um, now, in this portion of Isaiah's prophecy, he's talking about the new steward that's going to take place. The old steward, the old steward was very wicked. Um, the new one is going to have this authority, but that's the brief context. But I want us to note how it reads in Isaiah 22 and verse 22, because we'll see the language is being borrowed exactly. Um, it says in verse 22, Then I will set the key of the house of David on his shoulder. When he opens it, no one will shut, and when he shuts, no one will open. This new steward over the house of Hezekiah, I believe, um, he's going to have this unparalleled authority second only to the king. Now, what's different is Jesus has unparalleled authority second to none, right? Matthew 28, he has all authority. Again, these keys, it's a, it's a call back to this, this messianic portion of the prophecy and showing it applies to Jesus here. So, because Christ has the authority to to open and close, to I think you might include providence in this, to direct the courses of human history. He's going to tell them something he's doing because of has, he has this authority. He's going to put an open door before them that no one can shut. Um, and he says, um, oh, where'd it go? Uh, yeah, in uh, middle of verse 8, because you have little power and you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. Now, little power or small church, this might be small in number or small in influence. Probably both is implied here. But what Jesus is saying here, because of their faithfulness and the fact that they have not denied his name and the fact that they have not bought into the teaching of, of Balaam or the Nicolaitans or the false prophetess Jezebel, Jesus is going to do something for them in this current life. He's going to give them an unbridled opportunity for evangelism for witnessing, for showing what the faith of Christ can do in a person's life and for others. And this is where I said there's just that, that little, not wordplay, but kind of a turning of a phrase. Philadelphia was known as the missionary city for Greek culture. Well, Jesus is going to orchestrate events in history to make Philadelphia the missionary city for his name and his faith. And it's because this small church remain faithful. I can't help but think about a congregation I know in Oregon, Sweet Home. They've been, as, as my mentor Mark Dunnigan said, Satan's been trying to kill that congregation for 50 plus years now. <laughs> They're 35 to 40 people, and they've maintained that for almost half a century. And yet, they're a vibrant, healthy congregation at, that's trying to be the best witness they can be in the small uh, boom town of Sweet Home, Oregon, and they're still there. No matter what, and they've been through a ton. You talk to the old, some of the old widows in the congregation, they remember when they built the building, they didn't have money for a floor. I'm not, they're not being hyperbolic. It was dirt. It was a cinder block and dirt building. The floor came later. I, I think of Philadelphia as that kind of church. Everything's going to chaos around them, and they're just... Hebrews chapter 12, right? Fixing their eyes on Jesus and running that race. They're not going to get distracted. They're not going to listen to those who are teaching falsely. Here's what Jesus said. Here's what Jesus wants us to do. And so we're going to do that. Who wants to do the final comment, if you have anything? Because I think that's the last bell. Okay, so game plan for Wednesday night. We will finish Philadelphia, do Laodicea, and then before we push into Revelation five, uh, 4 and 5, um, it won't be a whole class. 
but we're just going to very briefly recap all seven churches, basically looking at what they had to overcome, and that's the thing we have to overcome today. So uh, thank you. Appreciate it.